So you can imagine how difficult those discussions were as we worked our way through those. In 2007, we had a shortage arrangement. And that's not to say that at any number of points along the way, there weren't fierce emotions displayed and any number, any number of us were tempted to walk from the table. But we kept telling ourselves one thing. Failure was not an option. Mother Nature had created a set of circumstances that didn't give us time to run to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court cases can take 20 years. We have to put generations of lawyers' children through school before cases like that get resolved. We had to find a solution. And so we reoperated the river. How Powell, Lake Powell and Lake Mead worked together Lake Powell being the savings account for the four upper basin states, Lake Mead being the supply basin for the three lower basin states, and Mexico. If we hadn't signed the 2007 agreement, the water that we're experiencing now, that we're getting because of this rich winter we had, water-wise, that's coming from Lake Powell to Lake Mead this year, that's going to allow Lake Mead to recover 30, hopefully 40 feet. Would never have happened had we not signed the 2007 agreement. Under the old regimen, it all would have stayed in Lake Powell until Lake Powell was virtually full. At the end of the day, we're enjoying the snowfall and the runoff we're going to get this year, but the system is still half empty. And we're still looking at the possibility of getting down into the lower reaches of the reservoir systems. And you're talking about a river system that has 60 million acre feet of storage on it. We're still looking at the possibility that one day we could face the unthinkable that we would be down cutting five, six million acre feet of use out of this system. Tell me where to cut it. The economic impact of that, and we've just done an analysis for a project we're working on, of what it means to the business community and to a community period if you have an interruption in your water supply or a perception of an interruption of your water supply and investors no longer reliably will invest in businesses in a community because they don't feel their investment is secure, it means 80,000 jobs just like that in Southern Nevada. Gone. That's not an acceptable premise. Now let's look at the flip side of this. Look at the amount of economic loss and destruction that has happened in the Mississippi watershed this year. No cargo, it has interrupted cargo transportation. It has destroyed thousands of acres of cropland. Whole communities have been put underwater and now have to be rebuilt. That's an economic drain on this country. There's a synergy. It is not until we overcome this belief that we have to fiercely fight for our local drops of water. And we begin to realize that there is so much more strength in solving two problems with one solution. And beginning to look outside the box in the 21st century, that we're going to be able to rebuild economies that especially right now need to be so desperately rebuilt. That's the challenge that we face as water managers and the, f the challenge the body politic faces as it tries to grapple with these issues. We've always said water is local. Not anymore. Locally, you can't survive. 20 years ago, Las Vegas would not have had a partnership with Metropolitan. It would not have had a partnership with the CAP. Today, we're paying the Central Arizona Project $350 million. And for that, 
they are storing 1.2 million acre feet of their unused entitlement in their groundwater basins for our future use. 20 years ago, water conserved in southern Nevada would have not inured as a benefit to Metropolitan. But when Metropolitan was struggling, all our conserved water we gave to Metropolitan under an agreement that in the future we get it back. Those synergies have to start coming to life and become a reality when the business community starts thinking about economic development and economic futures. It's the silent destroyer. Climate change, I'm not going to get in to the religion of that argument. From my standpoint, it's a question of adaptation. We're going to add, what, 100 million people to the population of this country? They're going to need food. They're going to need jobs. They're going to need a secure place to live. We're part of a global economy where the population is going from its current 7 billion to conservatively 9.5 billion, possibly 11 billion. 40% of the world's land is already in agricultural production. How much more are we going to put into agricultural production? How do we bring technology to bear to grow more food with less water? How do we bring more technology to bear to produce more energy with less water? Something we're going to be talking about. Energy is rapidly outpacing agriculture as the number one water user. There's a zero-sum game unless we start talking about the foundational issue. Yes, it makes great folklore to fight about water. But the future isn't about a battle. The future is about finding solutions that solve multiple problems and building a new infrastructure in the 21st century that can protect and enhance American communities Ameri and Americans' economic vibrancy. That, in my mind, is the challenge for the 21st century. And the sooner we can grasp that notion and are willing to talk about something we've been unwilling to talk about, we're going to start feeling the consequences. It's a challenge, but it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to create that next economy that's just sitting there waiting to be created. I'm always the optimist, and I look at it from the point of opportunity. Let's not miss an opportunity. Let's not let it pass us by. Thank you.